welcome. My name is Dr. Sandy Von Chapman. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the founder and chief director of the Center for Brain Health. And I am a professor in the School of Behavioral and Brain Science at the University of Texas at Dallas. Oh, we are so excited and can hardly wait to hear some exciting discussion. I just wanted to share a little bit about what the center's all about. We are category breakers. Our 125 plus scientists, research clinicians are really defining this whole area of what it means holistically to break down silos to be brain healthy. We're also challenging the status quo because we're a little bit rebels and you'll see why I like Harris so much in a minute. We're rebels because we're no longer going to accept fixed mindset, fixed IQ, this idea that you're destined to become what your genes tell you, but that so much can be done. At the end, I'm gonna share with you some other ways that you can engage with us uh, as, as we move forward. So with that in mind, I am so ready to introduce Dr. Harris Ayer. But before I do, I have to do a big shout out um, to Phil Ritter. And Phil, I know that if you're not on yet, you will be soon. Phil is someone that many of you know because he's helped so many of us in Dallas and really around the country and really the world. Well, Phil sent me an email back. Harris, I don't know if you remember, but I saved it. It was June 7th. And he said, Sandy, I've got someone that you need to meet that I want to share. You have similar missions. And his bold mission is to end the one size fits all approach to brain health, the personalized and precision, precision approaches to care. And so, you know, when you get those emails, you're like, oh, really? Oh boy, did my life change when I met Harris Ayer. It, And you will see in a minute why that was a transformative convening. So thank you, Phil, for always caring about us and connecting mine. If Phil connects you to someone, you need to respond. So let me introduce Dr. Harris Ayer. He is beyond humble for all he's achieved in his first three plus decades of life. He is an MD doctor. He's a PhD doctor scientist. He's an entrepreneur. He's an executive. He's a bold thinker and he's a doer. Dr. Ayer is pushing new frontiers on radical approaches to improving brain health outcomes. He believes advances in brain health outcomes will be driven by real convergence across siloed disciplines. And that's really our goal is to break down these silos of the way people look at the brain and to look at it more holistically. And this will only be achieved through rich collaborations and close integration of diverse disciplines and major economic, public and government sectors. To this end, he co-founded the Proteo Institute to explore this topic. This has led him to co-develop the whole field of brain capital, which he will speak about today. He's also been exploring how innovative diplomacy practices can be adapted to promote brain health. He already has more than 100 publications. He's co-editor of a forthcoming book by the Oxford University Press. That's transdisciplinary science of deeply embedded in this field of brain health. For his unparalleled work, He's been noted by Forbes magazine as 30 under 30, and I think it was for Genius Minds, as well as being a Fulbright scholar. Even with all this, I don't know how, he finds time to enjoy golf, hiking, swimming, meditation, podcasts, foreign policy, and history. I hope he sleeps, don't you? Anyway, you'll enjoy his accent. He's originally from Northern Australia. We are so honored that he now lives stateside with us. Open your mind, get ready to be stretched with new possibilities with Dr. Harris Ayer, an insatiable intellect and humanitarian. Harris, take it away. I, I am very grateful for that introduction, Sandy. Um, I, I could give this whole talk in a Texas accent if you'd like, but I, I think I should sp stick with my Aussie one. Um, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm glad to be with you all. Um, Sandy, I, I, you know, have 
tremendous regard for you. Uh, as you outlined, grateful to Phil for introducing us. And as we've talked about, we, we are kindred spirits. As you've mentioned before, we both like to uh, uh, you know, go against the status quo. We like to turn fields on their heads. We like to break silos um, and we're rebels, where, where maybe we're neuro rebels or something like that. Maybe that's a, another term. So thank you very much, Sandy, and for all the help uh, you, you've given me and guidance uh, as well. Uh, I think that you know, you've made um, you know, me in many ways feel safe to, 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 to promote and, and articulate this brain capital concept because it is very radical and it is very untraditional, but it's very safe to, to share it with you. So, so thank you. And uh, I can imagine that, you know, this is uh, your, your leadership style and why the CBH Center for Brain Health there is so successful and so well regarded. So, so thank you. And, and I, I, I would love to come to the CBH um, one day. I haven't been there physically yet, but I do hear that the building is, is incredible um, and, and also just very uh, multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary. Um, I, I did live in Texas, I should say, in the last three years. I lived in, I guess, the second best city in Houston, because Dallas is the best. Um, and I miss Texas a lot. Uh, and I know I miss it because I, I listen to more country music now since I left Texas. So it shows that it has a, a place in my heart. So without further ado, let's uh, get into it. I'm going to share my screen. What we're going to talk about today is brain capital. I would hope that by the end of this uh, talk, you'll all be brain capital builders, newly minted brain capital builders. And I, I would suggest that you already are, and you maybe didn't know it. A lot of what we're going to talk about with brain capital is fairly intuitive and obvious, but it, it just hasn't really been perhaps assembled this way before. So you are all brain capital builders, and I encourage you to continue uh, on your quest in doing that. So let's talk about a really contemporary issue to set the scene for why brain capital is critical. So the OECD, um, which is the economic uh, perhaps variant of the United Nations based in Paris, just last week published an economic outlook report. And they said that building confidence amid an uncertain recovery is critical for the global economy. That's really interesting. Um, but I would, I would suggest that how can we build confidence in an uncertain time if we don't really think at a societal deep level, at an economic level about brain health? Because without brain health, we cannot have psychological resilience and confidence. So economic thinking, you know, is very traditional. And so how do we instill a more brain health centric brain skills and neurocentric approach to economic thinking and that's really what brain capital is about um, so you know we really we really just to put it clear we can't have confidence in an uncertain economic recovery without brain health that's that's what i would suggest so um, this brain capital concept, uh, Sandy, uh, has been pivotal to helping me to articulate it and refine it and is very supportive of, 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 of furthering this initiative and this work. Uh, Ian Robertson as well. I'd like to make a shout out to him for, for his support. Um, this is uh, a project that really began with a paper that's just been accepted in Molecular Psychiatry and Neuroscience Journal. It's a, it's a global team of people. Um, as you can see there, and I'd particularly like to make note of the OECD's New Approaches to Economic Challenges Unit. Uh, that is an, an elite unit within the OECD of which William Hines, an economist, is the head of, of, and it's really very interested in this topic of brain capital and, and really anything that's, that, that is sort of an innovative way of thinking about the economy. So I'm particularly grateful to, to William um, for his support. Um, so, okay, what is brain capital? Let's get a little bit more into the nitty gritty uh, before we talk about um, how we can action it and build it. So brain capital allows us to track brain health and brain skills in a brain economy. And I'll explain what all those things mean. And brain capital can be conceptualized as a, as a new form of capital. Perhaps it one day could be considered as an actual asset class that could be you know, exchanged on a stock exchange or something like that, or it can be put into an, an accounting framework and corporations will have to consider it. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. 
well, what is the brain economy then? Let's break apart the brain capital concept. The brain economy is an economy that increasingly demands cognitive skills. Um, it's an economy where innovation is a tangible deliverable of employee productivity. And it's an economy where digital innovation and automation is on the rise. And we all know that with COVID, uh, at least in the last six months, the brain economy has just got even more brainier, if, 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 you, if you will. Um, you know, we have uh, a lot of people that have been uh, laid off, um, which is unfortunate. And we have a lot of jobs that have been lost due to automation. So the brain economy concept is very real now during COVID. And it's just going to get even more relevant in the coming years and decades. As we all know that automation and innovation is on the rise. Many people uh, who have perhaps could be described as lesser skilled jobs, their jobs are in peril. So. What do we do to help those people, to help to build their, their brain health, to build their you know, IQ, their cognitive abilities, to reskill them, to help them to live a meaningful life and a productive life? How do we do that? It's really important. Brain skills, uh, as you can imagine, and this is something that the, the Center for Brain Health is, is expert in, brain skills are emotional, social, and cultural intelligence type skills uh, combined with cognitive activities. And, and brain skills are obviously very critical in the COVID world. Uh, all of us have had to adapt, be agile, manage stress, manage uncertainty, you know, and we're still managing it because we don't know what's going to happen month to month. Um, so very critical. What is brain health? Uh, again, something that the Center for Brain Health is, has really pioneered um, the, the articulation of brain health. Uh, well, I believe that, that brain health encompasses cognitive and emotional strengths. Um, brain health really is sort of neuronal health or the, the, the health of the cells in the brain and com compromised brain health greatly increases the risk of common diagnoses, whether they're psychiatric or neurological diagnoses, ADHD, depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia. Um, so this is uh, the conceptualization of brain health. So let's just recap now uh, as we move into a more applied um, context of brain capital. So, so brain capital is brain health and brain skills in a brain economy. That's uh, what it is. And it, it's across the lifespan. It's relevant to kids, relevant to older folks and anyone in, in between. So brain capital is extremely aligned with the Center for Brain Health. As I mentioned before, Sandy and I are kindred spirits in many, many ways. And, and so it, it makes sense that uh, brain capital and, and Center for Brain Health are very well aligned. Um, I have to have, have deep regard and have cited often um, these outputs from the Center for Brain Health, whether it's uh, the work uh, of Sandy and Ian in articulating the concept of cognitive capital, uh, which, is, which was very informative in developing the brain capital model, whether it's brain omics, you know, brain and, and, and economics uh, that Sandy coined, um, you know, again, a very silo breaking term and concept. Uh, or, or whether it's the actual uh, brain health project, um, uh, which is represented there on the right uh, with the pinwheel and the, the different elements of that the, that are being incorporated into a brain capital index to be bolstered and tracked over time. Um, all of this has been very relevant to the brain capital field. And I'm, I'm sure if you have any questions about any of, of these works, uh, Sandy and, and other folks at the Center of Brain Health would be happy to to answer them, but I, I, I really recommend them. Um, so, so let's talk, we've, we've gone now through brain capital and the, and the basic concept of it. Um, let's talk about now the great reset that we're in. We are, the World Economic Forum describes the COVID crisis as creating an, a global sort of socioeconomic reset. So what does that mean? Well, if you look here, it means that where we're now shaping an economic recovery. So now is the time to think about new approaches to economic problems. We're redesigning social contracts, skills, and jobs. So now is the time to embed brain health deeply. You know, we have an opportunity. This is a great opportunity for us all to advance the cause of, you know, brain capital, brain health. Um, we're looking at more sustainable business models. Uh, we're looking at restoring health in the environment. We're looking at strengthening regional development, uh, which is critical as we're all sort of somewhat isolated at home or in our local communities. And we're looking at really revitalizing global collaboration 
And I respect um, Sandy and Ian and the work that they're doing in the Brain Health Project for really harnessing global expertise. Um, so this is what the World Economic defines as the Great Reset. So, so then now let's transition into actioning brain capital. How could we action brain capital? Uh, well, we can think about an investment plan. There are many ways that we could invest in brain capital and many of you that you will know of and will have thought of before and some that are perhaps new to you. Um, we need to think about brain capital in all policies uh, because this cuts across all of the different policy areas from you know, multiculturalism to transportation to women's affairs, et cetera. And how about we think about a brain capital index uh, again, to in the interest of, of building something here and tracking something so that we can hold uh, organizations or countries or states accountable to this brain capital concept. So the brain capital investment plan, as I described, um, very much, uh, you know, the goal here was to pull together all the different ways we could invest in brain capital. And many of these are very unconventional. So uh, we know about government grant making. Uh, we know about the role of philanthropy. That's one of the, the things that I learned a lot about in Texas was the, was the really important role and the valuable role of philanthropy. But what, are, what about these other approaches? How can we consider engaging with tech companies? How can we consider uh, engaging with governments uh, to look at bond mechanism, complex financial instruments that that governments can issue that could propel us forward? Um, or what about social impact investing, which I know there's a lot of that going on in Texas. Um, is there something we could do with social impact investing in, you know, in the brain capital, the brain health field? Um, very interesting when you go through these uh, forensically and systematically and, and think about their relevance. And many of these could be, you know, have, haven't really been leveraged sufficiently in the brain capital, the brain health field. So, we need to get busy and we are looking to explore all of these. Um, here's an exemplar uh, uh, called the Healthy Brains Global Initiative, uh, a, a very innovative way of investing in brain health. Um, the Healthy Brains Global Initiative is, is supported by the likes of the World Bank, the United Nations, uh, OECD, uh, UNICEF, et cetera. They're looking to raise $10 billion of sovereign bond uh, capital to fuel uh, really the largest ever uh, amount of research into brain health. Uh, this project is initially starting in the youth area um, and will explore other areas over time. But this is a, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to look into this project. Um, it's, it's been running now for a couple of years and is looking to take the first tranche of significant capital here in the coming, uh, coming months, potentially. So very exciting and, and really, Big, big news for our field. So now uh, let's talk about brain capital and all policies. Um, we need to think about brain capital and brain health is not just relevant to healthcare, which we normally think about it or, or academic work, but it has very tangible impacts on all the different policy areas you can see here. And uh, I respect that the Brain Health Project, uh, the Center for Brain Health is looking into all of these different areas, whether it's military and veterans health, whether it's um, uh, sports and recreation, whether it's education. So, you know, let's just take uh, to dive into this uh, women's affairs uh, for one example. There is a, a tremendous uh, amount of work uh, that, is, that determines that there is a sex and gender difference between many elements of women's brain health versus men's brain health whether it's the neuroscience and the, and the hormonal influences on the neurons, uh, which influences different symptomatology, perhaps different treatment approaches. Perhaps there are, you know, uh, therapy plus medicine or therapy plus hormone therapy approaches that can be developed and that are being developed. So that's just one example of in the women's affairs area where there is a huge need to, 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 uh, to understand this more. Um, so now let's, think about from a workforce perspective, what does brain capital, what could brain capital mean in the, from a workforce perspective? And I know that um, Stephen White and the Brain Performance Institute is thinking hard about this. What, what can we do for workplaces and for employees to bolster their brain health? Um, well, I wanna talk about a recent uh, report that came out again from the World Economic Forum in collaboration with Willis Talvis Watson 
they developed a human capital accounting framework. This is a way of, of really saying that traditionally we haven't considered human capital in almost much of a sense of in corporate balance sheets in profit and loss statements and, and in sort of asset sheets. So let's move uh, uh, human capital. Let's move uh, really important things into tangible asset classes for corporates. So that if you know there may be tax benefits for companies to invest in brain health, to invest in their employees, to invest in their their employees' brain performance, to be much more really socially accountable as corporations. So that's what this is all about. This is how do you go? How do you take really refined taxation accounting principles and try to leverage them to emphasize human capital? And I propose that. Why don't we adopt this and think about refining it for brain health, brain capital? Um, why can't that be done? It, it certainly seems like it can be done. Um, this is just a, a simple little algorithm here from, from the World Economic Forum's report. You can see we have total workforce value uh, is calculated by beginning workforce value plus the value that's added when you invest in your workforce development over time. Uh, minus the value that's reduced, impaired or redundant skills or decrease in workforce engagement. Um, so you can see here that you know, this is a, a way of, of saying that you, we can add value to employees by investing in their brain health or their brain capital. Um, and we can also uh, mitigate the lost value of employees by, by, by seeing if they're struggling, you know, particularly during COVID, a lot of people stressed um, may not be performing so well. So how do we help to, to, to really help those people, particularly if they're working from home, they may be a little bit isolated. You know, maybe there are ways that we can look out for them. Um, and, and so what does this mean then from, a, from sort of an operationalizing perspective? And I, I, I think that, that Steve White and the Brain Performance Institute is, is very sophisticated with this thinking, but what does this mean for policymakers? What does this mean for chief human resource officers? And what does this mean for board members of, of corporations? This is really interesting uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a potential way to use these accounting and taxation principles to, to really transform uh, brain health of society, brain capital of society. This is just another example of, a, of a, I would describe it as a very similar approach to the, to the previous accounting framework. This is called the the culture of health for business practices. Um, and it comes from, in part, the Global Reporting Initiative, which is a, um, a very uh, sort of contemporary, what's called uh, Environment, uh, Sustainability and Governance, or an ESG corporation, uh, a group, think tank group, that is looking to track more sort of socially accountable parts of businesses. So how do we not just track businesses based on you know, profit, but how do we track them based on these other areas, environment, uh, sustainability and governance issues. So another predicate for how we can, we could refine this, I think, to get much more granular on brain capital, brain health, brain skills. So, you know, let's do that. Uh, and I want to talk now about the the Brain Health Project. Um, I know many of you will, will know about it uh, and will have, will have heard presentations of it and probably in, involved in it as scientists or maybe you're participating in it. But I do see the Brain Health Project as an exemplar um, of, of building brain capital. I know there is a big vision to develop and it's, ha and it's happening now, uh, a, this Brain Health Project providing brain health tools and a brain health index to people globally through digital platforms, through scalable means. So this is, um, there, there's a wonderful scientific advisory group, which I've you know, described as blue ribbon uh, scientists from all around the world. Um, and then there is also a tremendous uh, advocacy and governance support from other folks, in, including the Admiral McRaven and the McRaven family. So really impressive uh, and, and wonderful to see the early results from the Brain Health Project. But of course, it's just the beginning. There is a very ambitious project to scale this. And I look forward to, to seeing that and, and you know, helping out uh, as I can. So the Brain Capital Index I mentioned before is a potentially innovative way to quantify brain capital and to track it over time. Um, so the, the, the Brain Capital Index is not 
precisely determined yet. We're in the process of building it out and refining it. So what I share with you now is some examples of uh, potential composites that could be included in the, in the brain capital index. We have brain health metrics, we have brain skills metrics, and you know, including common ones like years of education, you know, but there are perhaps ways of, of quantifying with gamification brain skills better. Um, and then what about uh, co-benefits of investing in brain capital? If we think about, say, if the Texas government, um, similar to CPRIT in cancer, if they invested a similar amount of money in the, in, the, in the magnitude of billions of dollars in brain health, well, then they can measure the co-benefits. They can measure the benefits of taxation revenue, employment from funding these types of brain capital and neuroscience initiatives, IP generation infrastructure. Um, so wouldn't it be wonderful to have a secret for the brain in, in Texas? And I know that there's a lot of talk about that. Um, we, can, we can capture the impact of that. Um, and, and that will help us to, to, to scale that out over time. If we can, if we can convince politicians and policymakers of, of the benefits, then they'll be more likely to invest more in our field. So another way of thinking about the Brain Capital Index is, you know, what could it look like? Well, it could include uh, GDP, commonly uh, sort of uh, economic uh, performance metric, uh, obviously profit and loss and these other types of economic and business measures. Uh, but what about if it's, it also is, is meshed with, in some way, the Brain Health Index from the Center for Brain Health? You know, what if we could collect a sample of people across countries? What if we could collect their brain health index and then merge that with some economic data uh, to try to develop a brain capital index as a, as a, as a measure of the society? Um, there are many other indices that are sort of newer age indices. The World Bank's Human Capital Index is one example, and, and there are others that, that you're probably aware of. So, you know, uh, it's up to us to articulate and refine what the Brain Capital Index could be and to make it as, as, as impactful as possible to, to quantify brain capital, to track it over time, to use it to benchmark, um, to get more investment, policy change, et cetera. Uh, it should be an instrument that can be leveraged to, to really improve our field. So the index, of course, must be uh, responsibly developed if we're going to do this. Uh, you can imagine, you know, in a couple of years time, we could develop a brain capital index that includes all sorts of neuroscientific metrics and economic metrics. Well, we need to ensure that, you know, there's data privacy and data security uh, concepts here. We need to we need to think through what are the what we know what the potential upsides are, but what are the potential downsides? How do we how do we risk anticipate risk mitigate? Uh, risk surveil and risk detect. Uh, this is a, a model that we've developed for responsible innovation that was recently published in Lancet Psychiatry. Um, so we, we really need to be thoughtful. You know, so many times technologies are built without uh, thinking through the unforeseen consequences over time. And I think we're seeing that in, in many ways with social media platforms. There's very powerful platforms and have helped society in many ways, but there are a lot of downsides. And so now we're sort of coming back and trying to rewire and, and reconsider the social media platforms to, to minimize the unintended consequences. So let's not let that happen for what we're doing here now with the Brain Capital Index. I'd like to say that, you know, there are obviously uh, diverse uh, disciplines required for, for brain capital. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to get across here is that Many of you in the audience can get involved. And even if you're not from a traditional sort of neuroscience-y clinical background, you can still get involved because we need you. And this is, again, breaking silos, um, something that, that Sandy mentioned and, and, and embodies herself. We need not just clinicians and scientists. We need to collaborate with, eco with economists, with philanthropists. We need to work with entrepreneurs. Diplomats could be involved. And I'll, ex I'll explain that in a future if we're doing it. I'll explain that in a couple of slides. If we're doing anything that's global that needs to be cross-pollinated across countries and cultures, diplomatic skill sets are critical. So, so on and so forth. Um, I hope you can see from the talk that these disciplines really are required. Um, and, you know, for the, for, the, for the junior people in the audience, you know, you can think about how do you want to chart your course to get involved in something like brain capital um, or the frontiers of brain health. So one of the things I'd like to emphasize is, is the importance of diplomacy. Um, 
we've been, uh, I've been fortunate, um, particularly through my Fulbright experience, to interact with many people from, from dramatically different countries, different cultures. And inter I've also interacted with many uh, former ambassadors and diplomats and such, and I've enjoyed that collaboration. And I started to think a few years ago, you know, how do we leverage these insights from diplomacy? If, if we want to do global impact uh, in brain health, we need to be able to, you know, navigate through how to, how to explain impact and potential for these projects and such in other countries. So we have gone through a process now of, of writing a number of papers and starting to action this concept of brain health diplomacy. And I'd be glad to send the papers to folks that are interested, um, really thinking about concepts like, to, to make this tangible for you, how do we ensure that innovation in brain health isn't just happening, you know, mainly in Silicon Valley, which is, which is generally the hub? How do we make sure that innovation can occur you know, in, in other cities in the United States? Well, what about in other countries? You know, what about in Australia, uh, where I come from? What about in, in, in low middle income countries? What about, you know, Vietnam? What about Nigeria? How do we try to make more equitable innovation agendas? Because we don't just want a sort of glut of innovative technologies and tools in, you know, Silicon Valley, um, you know, or even in Dallas, we don't just want them to be centralized there. We want these to be available. So how do we do that? Well, it, you know, it needs diplomatic uh, skills and expertise. Um, uh, and, and I would like to note that I, you know, I had the, the, the recognition that, you know, the Center for Brain Health and Sandy is engaging folks like uh, Admiral McRaven. You know, he is he has he has many hats and many skills, but one of them is as a diplomat, you know, and, and through his sort of skills and expertise, he, he is for sure able to uh, extend the reach of the brain health project. Um, so, you know, the Center for Brain Health is embodying this this concept of, of bolstering brain health diplomacy skills. So so let's get back now in, in, in concluding in the next couple of slides to the, this OECD commentary, this traditional thinking, you know, let's build confidence amid an uncertain recovery, which we said isn't really possible, unfortunately, without, uh, without things I mentioned here on the right. We need a grant, if, we need, if we're going to achieve this, we need a granular understanding of brain capital. We need to have brain health and brain skills so that people can be confident amid uncertainty. So, so how do we do that? Well, we need approaches to drive these improvements. We need projects like the, the Brain Health Project, we need policy thinking, we need advocacy, and we need more funding. Um, so, so thank you, OECD, for, for the great work, uh, but, but let's, let's, uh, let's refine this and let's, let's get serious and think about how brain capital can help them to achieve what they want to achieve. So where to from here? Um, again, uh, a, a lot of this will be, will be done hopefully in collaboration with the Center for Brain Health. We need to host summits. We need to think this through better. Um, this is going to involve a lot of smart people in the room uh, from different disciplines. We need to develop this brain capital index. We need to think about other uh, levers. Can we do some economic modeling? And we're already starting to do some with OECD. Can we think about policy development? You know, is there a role for a dedicated lab or a working group or, or an institute uh, focused in brain capital? Uh, perhaps this would help to really cons consolidate this field further and propel it in the future. So uh, I'd like to say in conclusion, and this is uh, out of respect to, to the Texans on the line, um, you know, they used to say that, that data is the new oil and Silicon Valley had usurped uh, economic prominence from the Texas oil fields. Well, can we say, move over data, brain capital is the new oil. And can we really work uh, you know, in collaboration with, uh, with Sandy and Ian and, and all the experts there at the Center for Brain Health to make sure that brain capital is seen as the new oil um, in a sense that it is seen as a really critical economic factor that we need to try to quantify and we need to try to build it up over time. Um, so. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your thoughts and questions and the discussion uh, as we look to, to build this out uh, further. Um, and again, 
I you know, hope that you all can see that, that you are brand capital builders and that you can get involved in, in this movement because it, it really is a movement that we're trying to develop here. So thank you. Harris, oh my gosh, <laughs> tremendous. I, can't, I know people are stretched mind. We're, I love that you've challenged each of us to be our own brain capital builders. I'm gonna go dig my oil well in brain capital. So I'm gonna <laughs> dig it profusely. What would you say is the impact of brain capital on the future of education and you know, university settings? That's a, that's a really interesting point, Sandy. Um, you know, I, I can probably get at that a couple of ways. Um, I think that from the, from the well-being of students in universities, um, you know, brain capital can be used to try to understand how the students are coping. Uh, and I know that you're thinking this through uh, uh, with, the, with the Brain Health Project and the Brain Health Index, but you know, how can we leverage these concepts to look after the well-being of students? Uh, and particularly now with, with students, they're going through a lot of uncertainty, right? With not being able to perhaps be on campus or if they are, and so they might be isolated at home and away from their friend groups, or if they are on campus, they're, you know, having COVID outbreaks and they're worried. So, so that's perhaps one way that we can, we can use these concepts to try to, to try to track you know, brain capital, brain health, brain skills of the students and, and, and invest in, in better ways to help them. And I think perhaps the other way, Sandy, is, um, you know, like what you're leading with the Center for Brain Health, from the programmatic perspective, how do we further support silo breaking initiatives? How do we, um, like what you're doing, we, you know, universities in many ways are very traditional and very siloed and, and we get these fiefdoms building up in tribes, but how do we bring them together into a, into a multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary center so that they can, you know, work together in a nice sandbox that's safe. Um, and, you know, so I think that, that what the, the type of work that you're doing and leading is, is important for helping to articulate the, the brain capital field. And it's obviously why I feel safe to, to share this and to work with you because, you know, this is a very humbling experience to build this out and it needs a lot of people. It needs people from different disciplines. So let's, let's just get to it and try to be non-hierarchical. I love it. Yeah. And I, you know, I couldn't agree more that the students that we just, we've started enrolling a hundred of UT Dallas students and from the get go, uh, Harris, to your point, you know, even the smartest students are struggling so much with, you know, worlds that, that's been upside down because they don't have the experience of someone that's, you know, can see that things will pass, there's other opportunities. So, uh, you know, and I think for what we're trying to get them to do is to approach it from a proactive and what we call left of boom. Let's do something instead of wait till you're in these really serious conditions of depression and stress. What if we address it with your brain capital from the get-go? So we're very optimistic about, you know, what the possibilities are with students around really the country and the world. Brilliant. Yep. Left of boom is, is great. Early intervention prevention. It's uh, yeah. terrific. Yeah. Before it gets going. So I have a question from Eugenia. Uh, she's asking, on, on the brain capital investment side, can you talk more about how the private sector and investors might get interested? We need to harness the private sector, right? In particularly in neuroscience, we often harness the governmental sector and non-governmental sector and foundations, but we can harness the private sector. Um, I would say, I'd answer this in a couple of ways. It's, very, it's a very exciting area. I'm obviously an entrepreneur. My other hat is as an entrepreneur helping to build out sort of early stage privately held companies, for-profit companies. So, so, you know, I think if I think about this in a systematic way, people can get involved in angel investing, um, small amount of, of investing. You can get involved in the ways that, that, that are, kept, that are uh, open to you based on your resources. So get involved in angel investing, crowdfunding for these types of brain health technology companies, uh, uh, there are a number of dedicated venture capital firms now that are focused in brain health technologies, um, which is terrific. I'm happy to share names with some people if, if they'd like of, of these different entities. Um, 
And, you know, I would say that scientists and clinicians, you can get involved in small ways with helping companies. What about advising a company? What mm -hmm. about helping them with their clinical mm -hmm. trial, you know, plans? What about helping with, with them with their product? If you're a clinician, you, you know, it's incumbent upon you as a responsible innovator to help companies to refine their products. If you don't think the product works well enough for whatever reason or, you know, doesn't have a particular feature you want, well, give feedback to the company and be open in the first place to using the technology and trialing it. Um, so there, there are uh, some ways that the private sector can be engaged. And, and of course, um, you know, uh, I think that, you know, we need to, as a field, engage social media companies. If we're talking about, let's talk about big, massive corporate private companies. How do we help them to try to refine their platforms to make sure that all of this sort of icky stuff is not happening with people's mm -hmm. brain health, you know, with cyberbullying, with, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the spread of, of, of suicide sentiments that can occur like a ripple across social media, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How do we help the social media companies to reform their platforms? Uh, so that's another way that you can get involved. So I could maybe just make one more shout out uh, and give a specific example. There is a fund called the Alzheimer's Disease Discovery Fund, the ADDF, uh, which is a, a novel form of, of fund called, called venture philanthropy, where a bunch of philanthropists, including Bill Gates and, and Jeff Bezos, et cetera, uh, gave money to this fund. And this fund is led and invests in, in Alzheimer's technology companies. And any of the returns that come from that money just get reinvested back into the fund. So the philanthropists that gave the money don't want to return. They gave the money. And now this fund is slowly building over time. Um, and has invested in some very interesting digital companies. So, you know, that, that, that ADDF fund is, is an exemplar, perhaps if people want to look at one uh, of, of an innovative sort of quasi-private, quasi-philanthropy organization. Mm -hmm. I hope that's a reasonable answer. That's a, that's a hot button topic for me, so I could talk about that for hours, but that, that's my little summary. Yeah, Harris, and you know, people are, there's a lot of questions coming up. One of the questions that people always, rise whenever you get to the brain. You know, it's like we can talk about anything else, but uh, you know, when we work with the Navy SEALs, they say, hey, wait a minute, the brain is the no fly zone because there's so much stigma related to it. And so confidentiality, you know, as companies begin to think about, you're looking at my brain capital, whoa, wait a minute, you can't know that about me. What do you think in terms of privacy and protection uh, in terms of those kind of issues related when we start talking about brain capital? I think it's critical uh, that we need to be very sensitive. You know, there is a lot of opportunity for exploitation of people's data, you know, finding out what, you know, people may have risk of dementia or have dementia or whatever it may be, or uh, they might be feeling surveilled in other ways. You know, if, if my brain skills aren't sufficient, will I get fired if I'm working at a, at a particular job? So it's critical uh, and we need to think it through. That's sort of this responsible innovation framework, um, you know, is all about, let's think through these unintended negative consequences. So, so, you know, we need to involve ethicists, I would say, neuroethicists and perhaps mm -hmm. lawyers in these types of discussions. I'm not a, not a deep expert in this area, but we need to think about, mm -hmm. you know, the legal, uh, you know, clauses and such to protect consumers and protect people that are going to be involved in this. We need to think about, you know, kind of opt-in, uh, opt-in uh, approaches as opposed to just blanket telling everyone to do it. You know, how about you do it if you want to opt-in or how about we do things like we, you know, in many ways you can only perhaps give a, this index to the consumer themselves. Maybe it never goes to their bosses or their, um, or their company. It's, it's purely, confidential to them. So I think those are some strategies that, that we need to think uh, through. And I, and I, I do know that, that Sandy, yourself and, and Steve at the Brain Performance Institute are thinking through these issues, mm -hmm. uh, also relevant to the Brain Health Index. So yeah, yeah. And, and we've got yeah an ethicist involved and you're absolutely right. We're letting the individual own their own data and not the employer can't, you know, not can't know that it's something that they embrace. So confidentiality is big key. So Ian, a question from Ian over in Dublin says, hey. Harris, great, great talk. Uh, and he said, could you elaborate how brain capital might be traded as a commodity? 
I, I, I would say to Ian that this is a, a concept that, that came from one of our co-authors on the paper, uh, Sandy, uh, the, the molecular psychiatry paper, uh, Professor Andrew Lowe from MIT, who's an economics expert. He suggested that brain capital could one day be traded um, as like a, an ETF, an, ex an exchange traded fund. Um, you know, the, the, this is something that's in development, so I'm very sort of, uh, you know, uh, reserved in, in sharing this because we need to think it through and thrash it out further, but maybe it would be possible uh, to, to, to think about, could we have a class of company stocks that we could put together in a little portfolio of companies that are the most brain health progressive in the world or in the country. And so we are in a sense thanking those companies and we're buying their stocks because they oh. prioritize brain health more than anyone else. And maybe there's like the top 10 and these companies are, you know, seen as very progressive and really leading. Um, so maybe that's an approach that we could take, uh, which, which then means that we need to think about how, how do we quantify the brain health progressiveness of companies? Um, I love that. I'm, you know, like lead certification for buildings. And that's one thing that we've talked about is how do we begin to certify brain, we call them brain healthy workplaces, but I think where they put their employees at the top. So I have another question from someone that's been involved in participating in the project. And she said, I've tried to get a lot of people involved, but people are resistant to the time investment. Even though the time investment, even for the project is not that much, how do we get people to take their brain seriously in the investment? Or if you're building your own brain capital to change that mindset? I think first of all, that one way of getting at this is we, we can always uh, work with with um, user experience people, right, Sandy, in, in our research and in our work so that we can try to make the process as efficient as possible and, and as enjoyable as possible. So, so we, we, we as a field of scientists and clinicians need to think about that. How do we make this as, you know, as fun and engaging and as quick as possible? Um, so that, that's sort of one thing uh, about the actual usability relevant to, to um, pe people that are engaged, patients, consumers. Um, but then how do we get people to take uh, this stuff seriously? I think a lot of it comes down to effective advocacy and, and, and messaging in a way. Um, and mm. this is something, Sandy, that, that, um, that, you know, that you're really phenomenal at is, is breaking down these really complex concepts into simple terminology, metaphors, ex analogies, et cetera. You, you know, the, 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 so, so I think this is critical. The, the, the way that you talk about the brain is like the engine in the head. Mm -hmm. um, well, if well, you, can de you can deconstruct that uh, analogy in so many ways and start thinking about the subcomponents of the engine and you know, what is the engine good for uh, and how does it help you navigate like a car you know, and how is that relevant to the brain? So, so I think this kind of sort of making this palatable and fun mm -hmm. and interesting and sort of simplifying it in many ways, simplifying the complex is really critical because there are, there are many people that are, you know, like the, the, the person that's asking the question is very sophisticated and very brain health aware, but there are a lot of people that just don't even think about this stuff. So how do we get to them? And, you know, we can get to them with, you know, analogies and metaphors. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so that's, I think, um, you know, some, some ways of doing this, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So I have a question from Jim in DC. He said, what role do you see national public policy playing in, enable, in enabling brain health habits and scaling adoption? How do we see public policy in enabling that? If we talk about policy settings is, you know, let's think about how do we refine these accounting frameworks uh, that, that I presented on, like the human capital accounting framework. How do we use policy levers and organizations like the SEC to emphasize companies to whether it's mandating them or encouraging them to, to say, please consider, um, you know, making people in your company as a tangible asset to your company's balance sheet, not an intangible asset. 
Um, how do, if in, when we've made people, uh, you know, in companies as intangible assets, they're really not thought of, there's no taxation benefits for companies. There's no, you know, co companies can much more easily let people go and not invest in their brain health because there's almost, there's no negative and there's no incentive for them. But if we make people a tangible asset of a company uh, balance sheet, like, you know, yeah. infrastructure or machines or something, then then there are many ways that we can give tax advantages to companies and incentivize them to invest in the brain health of, uh, of uh, the, the, the employees. So, so I think this is a kind of a policy setting that is relevant to maybe for-profit corporates and non-for-profit corporates that, you know, I think this is one sort of simple thing that we can do. And, and I do know that the SEC is thinking along these lines. Mm. So how do we, how do we lobby them? Uh, how, how do we engage them? How do we lobby them and help them to, to achieve this? And how do we work with some, perhaps some leading edge companies that are trying to do this uh, and, and get them to help as well and be the exemplars. So. Yeah. Tremendous. So I have a question from um, a doctoral student, Sarah. She, she, two things. One, she wants to know, can you give us a, and I always get asked this, can you give it to me in one or two sentences, a definition for brain capital? And then second, how can we protect the value of people who are considered lower brain capital? Brain capital is a novel form of capital or asset class that prioritizes brain health and brain skills. Um, that's my one sentence summary. And- um, How does it protect then, the value of people with lower? Yeah, obviously this is critical. We don't, we don't want discrimination, uh, whatever we want to call it, neurodiscrimination. Um, I, I would say that we need to we need to think about maybe, you know, not seeing it like there's a, there's a sort of upper class or a lower class in this way, but let's just think about equity. Let's just think about how do we invest and try to get equitable brain health and brain skills across the community. And that means, you know, uh, helping folks, you know, minorities, um, uh, perhaps there's some gender-based sort of discrimination issues that that, that that limit people's abilities to get educated and, and such. So let's think about this from an equity lens. Maybe that's a nice, nice, nicer way of doing it. Um, and I know that, again, the, the Brain Health Project that, that you're running, Sandy, it has an equity focus. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, there are also some other uh, centers that are popping up around the country that are specifically trying to build equitable uh, you know, brain health and brain skills. So that, what does that mean? That means investing more. It means investing in access to care, uh, enrolling more people from d diverse ethnicities in research. Uh, it means involving them in, in clinical trials and things like this, because it's, it's critical. You know, mm -hmm. we need to get away from the traditions of just enrolling people in, in research, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and clinical care that are sort of Caucasian wealthy people, but, you know, need to make things much more multicultural and diverse and multi-ethnic. So, uh, and we, yeah, and we do, we do everything that we need to, we need to do everything that we can to, to prevent any sort of discrimination. Yeah. And one of the things that we do, uh, Harris, that you know, is that we try to get people to not be comparing higher, lower, but it's all about you being your own potential. And so are you where you want to be, or do you want to be better next year? And, so a lot of what we do to try to equalize that is not you're lower than anybody or higher than anybody, but you're you. And so do you want to stay this same next year or do you want to be higher so that they set their own goals and say that you can be both? So um, we just have time for a few more questions. Phil Ritter, I think I owe him one since he's the one that made you, brought you into our lives, which is transformative. Talk about the car and the engine. You're kind of like our fuel, our oil and fuel that we're doing. Uh, Phil Ritter is asking, how do we monetize brain capital to create a measurement unit for brain capital uh, and assign a unit economic value? And is brain capital fungible across all human disciplines and endeavors, or should we imagine various brain capital asset classes? Oh, uh, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> Phil, that's a tough one. 
can we monetize one, it in terms of companies? I think you addressed some of that as we, you know, reward companies for doing that rather than, uh, you know, that they're investing in their people as a, a way. But, you know, as a unit, if, if, a, if a company's brain health index, for example, improves from one year to the next, would they get more, you know, write-offs to be taking care of who works for them? you know, and disciplines, you know, if we think about brain capital and across human disciplines, I, you know, I hope that it's really across disciplines, don't you? Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, let's think about, you know, it should be relevant to this incentivizing companies it should be relevant to companies across sectors, transportation companies, aerospace companies, hospitality companies, you know, you name it, you think of it, that it should be relevant to them. Um, I, you know, I think one way of getting at Phil's uh, question is, I see brain capital, let's advance brain capital through a number of mechanisms. We've got the advocacy mechanism, which is critical. We've got nonprofit mechanisms. We need to do research, economic modeling, policy work. But then of course there is the for-profit approach um, and actually building companies and corporations around brain capital or partnering with other asset managers or something like this. Um, the purpose of my talk today was was to really give a broad sense of this stuff. So I didn't want to go into the privatization approach. I, I really see it as one lever. And yeah, we could we could do something with this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's going to require a very sophisticated team to do it, right? We're going to need economists and you know investment bankers and neuroscientists and you know, very a wide group of people. So it's an you know, interesting one. I'd love to explore it. And if Phil's got ideas, I'd love to talk to him about it. Let's do it. And okay, I'm gonna, does have this ideas. is gonna be the last question um, that I wanna ask. And because, you, because you're a psychiatrist too, um, what they're asking is when we think about brain health, you know, from my perspective, how can we partner with the medical community without putting labels on patients based on index scores? Because right now, what happens so much is that brain is only considered after something happens, after right a boom, as Jeff Ling would say, Dr. Ling would say, you know, it's always like you wait for the big explosion of depression or Alzheimer's, but you never are left a boom. You know, and right now in medicine, it's usually about what's your diagnosis or else you're fine. How do we partner more to put this without putting labels on people that you can be your own best self and that it's all, all it's really okay to be, you know, to work on your brain from a positive point of view. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a very profound point. Um, and a, a lot of what we're talking about is really modernizing the field of psychiatry in many ways and modernizing the field of neurology. And I, I, I just kind of think that the you know, whether you're a psychiatrist or a neurologist, you know, you should really be the quarterback of um, very sophisticated collaborative care models and very sophisticated approaches to sort of step care and staged care. So if you're a psychiatrist or you're a neurologist, how do you think about working with psychologists, you know, doing very, you know, preemptive stuff, PCPs, primary care physicians, uh, physician assistants, all the allied health people, you know, PTs, social workers, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, all these people have a role in sort of very early detection and, and early risk mitigation of issues. Um, and maybe we need to think about also adding to that is sort of lay counselor type people. You know, how do we, how do we make maybe an, an army of brain capital builders, people that are not trained in healthcare, but that are going out into the community and just evangelizing this stuff and doing almost like brain health first aid. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so, so I think if you're a psychiatrist and neurologist and you want to be contemporary, then you know, be you know, be the be the quarterback of this type of thinking and try to lead the change um, because you are the person with the knowledge of medicine and neuroscience uh, and the and the way that the clinical milieu works and because you lead it so so you got to own it and you got to build out the future that you want to see like what we're talking about this sort of left of boom models so yeah tremendous well there's a lot more questions that we could ask but i want to respect everyone's time so harris i think we're going to have to have you on again and just do question answer you know just kind of a little preamble and 
almost have a dialogue back and forth because I do think there's a lot more. You've triggered a lot of food for thought and um, you are such a stretcher of intellectual functioning, you know, and how can we make it so that humanity, because you are a humanitarian, that's what impressed me the most about you is to bring out the most in people and not to do anything, as you say, that would degrade them. So we're just, thank you again, Phil, for bringing Harris and us together. And I can hardly wait to see what we're going to achieve. So I want to just give some people some heads up because Harris fortunately has agreed to talk to some of our students after this. Thank you for that. To mentor the next generation of in this whole new field, you said you've developed a new field of brain capital. I said we've developed a new field of brain health of discovery. And uh, so I want to work together and we kind of consolidate what we're doing. Uh, but I want you all are all hungry for this. Thank you for joining us today with Dr. Harris Ayer. I want uh, to make sure that you know and sign up for our Frontiers next Friday, where we're going to have Dr. Robert Green who is the professor at Harvard and will speak on the path to preventive genomics. Brilliant, and he's, he's gonna share a lot with that. And then on October 22nd, and Harris, you're gonna to wanna to come to this one, Bruce Mao uh, is gonna be at Sips and Science on Thursdays at 7 uh, p.m. I don't know if you know who Bruce Mao is, Harris, but he is one of these genius design thinkers and you know design space. But he loves this, and he said, during a time of massive change, he said, when I heard, hear the term massive change, I get so excited. Most people, when they hear their term, say, no, I want massive stay the same. And you know what we tend to say is our brain loves to innovate, and so if we can embrace the potential. So you all won't want to miss Frontiers next Friday, uh, and hearing Bruce Mail on October 22nd. Thank you all for helping us, Harris. Let's go make better brain, better lives, and better world, and figure out a way to make this grow as fast as we can. We've got a lot of work to do. Absolutely. Let's get Thank to it. Thank you so much Thanks, for Sandy. Appreciate being it. with us, and I look forward to regular conversations with you and working together. Awesome. Yeah, me too. This is just the beginning, so we've got our initiative underway. Yes. Terrific. Thank you all so much. Dan, his, our deputy director, wants to thank you too. Bye-bye.